Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this session of my NPTEL course, Appreciating Linguistics or Typological Approach. So that is the third type, um, sorry the third reason why we see the similarities. Then the fourth one is the typology, typological similarity or the or you can say types in the similarity. So when I say typologically Hindi is different from Telugu, that means Hindi belongs to a different language type. Telugu belongs to a different language type. When I say typologically Hindi is similar, uh, similar to uh, let us say Marathi that means there are a lot of similarity at the syntax, phonetics and morphological level in these two languages. So, if typologically languages are same that means their grammatical structure um, generally considered to be same so that would result in the, um, in the similarities among languages. And finally, I would also give you, an, uh, give you some idea how the universal, so the linguistic universals or the language universals can help us to understand how the languages are going to be similar or certain similarities because of certain similarities among the languages, we can actually come up with some universals. So, when I say universals, I am talking about um, certain grammatical phenomena or linguistic feature which are commonly found in different languages of the world. Considering the world is multilingual and in India especially we have hugely diversified linguistic communities. So, uh, it, it the, the like the linguists they have been continuously trying to find out how to account for certain features which could be commonly available in most of the world's languages. So, those are going to be considered as linguistic universals. Okay? So, um, um, what will what will we do? I'll I'll focus primarily on um, on a few um, let's say languages again. Uh, and first, let's look at a few words that languages might have similarity. So, if you um, if you have if you go back to the German and the Swedish example that we have had, I have already shown you um, the verb is similar. Give us as a pronoun that is also similar and in English also. So, if you compare now let us uh, let us try to recall what all languages we had. We had um, in the category of differences we had, we did check the data from English, Polish, Hungarian and the fourth one was uh, English, Polish, Hungarian and let me go back, I think it was Turkish. So, uh, these are the languages which have differences and in the similarity category what did we have? We had German and Swedish. Okay? Now, go back and then find out if the different languages, the first four languages, the data that we have checked, do they have any similarity with the similar languages like German and Swedish? So, that is a question for you. I am not going to um, explain it. My, I would give you some hint how to work on it. So, this would be find out the lexical similarities. So, lexical similarities means similarity at the word level or the lexicon level, phrase level. So, do find out if there is any similarity in the first, any of the first four languages, first four and next two. So, what are the first four? English, Polish, Hungarian and Turkish. What is the next two? German and Swedish. So, now your work is to find out if there is any lexical similarity with German and Swedish if you check the first four languages and then get back to me um, later. Do it for yourself and if there is any confusion do get back to me. Okay? Um, so, now with this information um, my like my question or I would like to highlight two questions that I that I found uh, as a puzzle in Moravzik's book. So, what are the two very simple questions? First question, how are languages different from each other and how are they similar? If there is a similarity at what level? If there is a difference at what level? 
Second, what are the reasons for the differences and for the similarities? And what could be the possible reasons? We have already discussed. So, there could be um, as far as the similarities are concerned, you might have the genetic relatedness, you might have the language contact, you might have shared cultural environment, then there could be types and finally, there could be universals. On the basis of the universals, you might find out um, certain languages which have, which have certain kind of connection and certain languages which might have certain kind of differences. Okay? So, I will start it uh, with, the, with the first one that I have that is the genetic relations. Okay? Since there are, there are two different kinds of similarity, similarities that we are talking about, one is structural, the other one is um, let us say functional or you can say phonological or morphological or lexical. And how it is structural? Uh, on, the, on the basis of the occurrence of the subject, the verb and then the object. Right? Now, um, let us see how these, uh, if you remember there are five different reasons that I was talking about in the, in the previous slide, when I, was talk, when I was discussing the previous slide. There could be genealogical similarity and there could be, um, there could be similarities related to what? Uh, it could be language contact. So, let us focus on the, on the genealogical similarities first and or at the same time we can also look at language contact issues and we will have certain data or certain empirical um, linguistic data from three different languages. One is Hindi which is one of the Indian, one of the most widely studied Indian languages. Then we have Japanese and then we have Turkish. Right? So, look at the examples on the slides 7, 8 and 9. What does the sentence mean? The sentence means it should be uh, like let us let me read. So, the first uh, sentence in Hindi is wo ladki maa ke liye paani laati hai. Right? So, it is a Morabs did not really get it uh, get the um, glossing very well. So, primarily it will be wo ladki maa ke liye paani laati hai. So, in such construction I am going to write it over here. So, let us not uh, focus on the uh, example on in the slide. So, the Hindi example is this. So, um, since we discussed the similarities on the on the basis of the word order or the function or, or you can say the lexical and the phonetic similarity. Um, now, let us see how the languages which do not have any um, contact or which do not share any geographic uh, proximity might also have certain kind of similarities. In this context, I would like you to have a look at the examples on this slide 7, 8, 8, 7, 8 and 9. The first one is from uh, Hindi, the second one is from Turkish, sorry the second one is from Japanese and the third one is from Turkish. Obviously, if you, if you uh, recall or if you can imagine the world map. Hindi does not have any language contact with Japanese and Japanese does not have any language contact with Turkish. But all the three languages which do not have genealogical similarity um, or, or the typological similarity on the surface, if you look at the word order, they, they have a striking similarity as far as the um, subject object verb is concerned. I uh, will read the Hindi example because that is a language which I can speak. Um, so, this is written, Ve ladki ki maa ke liye paani laate hain. What does this mean? They bring water for the girl's mother. So, they bring water for the girl's mother. If you uh, look at this construction, what is the subject, object and verb or what is to, to put it in a simpler form? what is the word order type that Hindi belongs to. So, Hindi has um, we ladki ke maa ke liye, so we is the subject, then the object is ladki ke maa ke liye for the girl's mother, so that is the object and then the verb, uh, sorry then another, uh, another object which is pani, so let us put both of them in the object category ladki ke maa ke liye and pani both and finally, laate hai which is the verb. So, what is the word order that Hindi follows? Hindi follows subject, object 
and verb. Now let us look at the Japanese data. So, here also you see they, then the girl, then the mother for, then water and then bring, bring and give together which would be um, which would be considered as a complex predicate those who know a bit of syntax in linguistics. Um, so, in Japanese also you have the subject which is they, who brings water? They and uh, then for who? For the girl's mother. So, that is one object and what is the third object? Sorry, what is the third uh, phrase or what is the third unit? Instead of calling it word or phrase, I would rather call it unit. The third unit is also an object which is water, that is O and finally, you have bring and give in Japanese. So, that will be the verb. So, Japanese also has S O V word order and how about Turkish? Turkish will have we will see how it behaves as far as the word order is concerned. So, in case of Turkish, we first have the girl, the girl and her mother. So, girl's mother. So, you have O, then you have uh, another O which is object and then uh, that means basically I am going to write one O. So, girl, girl's mother for and then water. And then finally, you have the subject and then the verb together. So, subject uh, is they, this would be um, they and bring and uh, they and bring together. So, Hindi and, ja and uh, Turkish would share um, similar kind of word order, I am sorry, Hindi and Japanese would share similar kind of word order whereas, Turkish is a little different. As far as the, um, the surface order, yeah the surface word order says ok. Now, let us see in addition to uh, the word order that we have um, in, in let us say in the, in the above two examples. So, the subject, object and verb that comes in Hindi also in Japanese, Turkish seems to behave in a different way. Besides that, is there anything else that gives you an idea that there could be some similarity between um, two different languages? The, the case of Turkish is a little tricky here actually. So, I made some mistake. So, you have to delete it ok. Yeah. Um, so, what is, uh, what is Turkish doing here? Um, Hindi and Japanese clearly there is SOV, but in case of Turkish, we do not really have the subject here um, mentioned, but then if you look at the object and verb, it is the first the object and then the verb. So, the O V connection that remains strong, though the subject is missing from Turkish, but it is understood that if it is bring here, they is going to come over here. So, that is the reason why you have you can say or you can clearly see Japanese, Hindi and Turkish, they follow similar word order which is subject, object and verb or, or to, to put it in a, in a more brief manner I would say object and verb. But besides that you, you as you notice that is not the only similarity that Hindi, Japanese and Turkish have, there is also similarity related to the possessor and possessor, possessum. Those who do not know what is a possessor and possessum that means, somebody who, who possesses something is a possessor and something which is being possessed is the possessed sum. Let us say I am going to show, let us say this is a pen, this pen belongs to me. So, that means, this is under my possession. If it is under my possession, I would be considered as the possessor. So, I am the one to who the pen belongs to. Then the second one is possessed sum. So, what is the possessed sum here? The possession is the pen. So, if you say Anindita's pen, that means, Anindita is the possessor and pen is the possessum. Now, let us see what is the possessor possessum relation um, in Hindi, Japanese and Turkish. So, in, in Turkish uh, and uh, so let us say first Hindi, so who is the possessor? The girl and who is the possessum? The mother, that is why the Hindi phrase is ladki ki ma. So, ladki ki means the possessor and ma is the possessum. Something similar happens with 
Japanese. So, in Japanese also you have the girl and then the mother. So, what occurs first? Possessor comes first, then comes the possessor. So, what is the possessor in Hindi? Ladki ki. That comes first, then comes the possessor mother. Something similar is also happening in Japanese. So, uh, if I would apologize for my uh, stupid pronunciation because I am not a Japanese speaker, but in this sentence in the Japanese data that is given in 8, ano ono ona no ko, so that is the girl which is the possessor that comes first, then comes the possessor, sorry, but then comes the possessum which is ha ha ni that is mother fa. So, this possessor possessum relation uh, remains to be um, the same in case of Hindi as well as Japanese. In Hindi also the possessor comes first then the possessum and in Japanese also the possessor comes first then the possessor. Now, let us look at the Turkish example. Do you have similar kind of relation in Turkish? So, what happens in Turkish? Kiz is the girl and anezi is the mother. So, that is also something similar first comes the possessor then comes the possessor. So, that is the second similarity the second category of similarity that we observe when we talk about um, Hindi, Japanese and Turkish. The third one is noun phrase and adposition. So, those who do not know what is adposition, adposition is a um, broader term which might include both preposition and postposition. Okay? Okay, let me write it here again in a more clear manner. So, I am writing here add position. This is like the umbrella term which might have preposition or it could also have postposition. Right? So, uh, when you say preposition and postposition, together you are going to call it add position. So, in case of add position and the noun phrase, there would be a difference between English and Hindi. Those who know Hindi, you compare it with English. When you say on the table, in Hindi what it will be? Table per. So, table is the noun phrase, per is the add position and it comes after the noun phrase. But what happens in English? On is the add position or it is a preposition and it comes before the noun phrase that is the table. So, there is a difference between Hindi and English as far as noun phrase and add position is concerned. But let us look at Hindi, Japanese and Turkish. Do you see any similarity or any difference? In case of Hindi, what is the add position here and what is the noun phrase here? The noun, I want you to focus on the phrase like ma ke liye for mother. Ladki ki ma ke liye. Let us not focus on ladki ki for the moment. We will talk about ma ke liye. So, when you say ma ke liye, what is the noun phrase? Noun phrase is mother. And what is the adposition? Adposition is liye. So, what comes first? The noun phrase comes first, then comes the adposition. That is why we call it postposition. Look at Japanese. Similarly, mother is ha ha and fo is ni. So, ha ha is the noun phrase and ni is the adposition. So, what is the what is the order? The order is like first the noun phrase, then the um, adposition. So, I am going to circle this. This is ma ke and liye. You need to focus on ha ha and ni for Japanese and for Turkish would be an si and isin if I can read it correctly. So, in all the three cases you see the noun phrase is coming first then coming the add position. That is why in all the three languages there would be post positions. And how it is different from English? In English this is a pre like this is considered to be a preposition and why this is why this is considered to be a preposition? Because it happens before the noun phrase. So, in spite of um, having no uh, language contact or in spite of having not having any other similarity you can see at least Hindi. Japanese and Turkish they have similarities on the basis of the word order and this word order can be tested uh, by, by examining the data or by observing the data and the position of the subject, object and the verb, the position of the possessor and possessum 
and the noun phrase and adjudication. Okay. So, uh, with this information, let us move to um, the, the next set of data that we have from two other languages, one is Arabic, the other one is Rapa Nui, right. So, in Arabic, uh, what is the word order? I will just briefly scan through it since I have already given you a lot of information how to identify the word order. I think it will be easier for you to read the Arabic data. So, in Arabic data, you have the verb then you have the subject and then you have the uh, you have the object. So, what is the sentence? So, the sentence is the Chinese took the money. So, when you say the Chinese took the money in Arabic took comes first then comes the Chinese then comes the money. So, it is the verb then the subject then the object and how do the possessor possess some relation work? Uh, how does it work? Uh, it works first comes the possess some then comes the possessor. And in case of the possessor and possessor, you see first it is house, then it is man. If I give you um, just two words, possessor and possessor, and I am giving you two words like house and man, what do you think? Who is the possessor? Does the man possess the house or the house possesses the man? Automatically, you should, you should get an idea that man is the possessor and, uh, and house is the possessor. And what is the, what is the occurrence? The occurrence here is unlike Hindi, Japanese and Turkish example, you can see possessor and possessum relations are different. So, in, the, in Hindi, it was possessor and possessum, but in Arabic, it is the other way around, possessum and the possessor. And how about um, the adposition and noun phrase? That is also completely different. In Arabic, you have a adposition comes first, then comes the noun phrase. So, look at this data carefully and find out whether they are different from the previous data set that we have discussed. Now, let us go to um, another language which is uh, uh, which is Rapa Nui. This, uh, this language uh, is spoken in the in the Easter island and it has originally the data has come from um, Chap in 1978 and I got it from Moravzik's book introducing language typology. So, what happens in Rapa Nui? Much like Arabic, you also see there is a similarity in the word order, the occurrence of the word order. You have verb, then you have the subject, then you have the object. The same sentence, Chinese took money, look at the words here. Much like Arabic, possessum comes first, possessor comes next and definitely like Arabic, the adposition comes first, then the noun phrase comes later. That is why the hers of the man and to Boston. So, these are the ones or, or if you compare Rapa Nui with Arabic, they belong to one type, Hindi, Japanese and um, the third one was Hindi, Japanese and uh, let me go back, I forgot, Turkish. So, Hindi, Japanese and Turkish, they belong to one type and Rapa Nui and Arabic, they belong to the other type, right. So, um, that that is the reason why you need to you need to figure out or you need to understand how do you or how how we are going to talk about language typology or the linguistic typology. So, linguistic typology would try to find out how you can have um, inferences drawn from the linguistic data and you can claim that see x y z languages they have these many similarities. So, they belong to one type. A, B, C languages, they have these similarities and they belong to this type and X, Y, Z and A, B, C do not have any similarity or do not have much similarity that is why typologically they are different. So, I hope and I expect with this information about similarities and differences in the world's languages, you should be able to find out the languages that you know whether they have more similarities or whether they have more differences and you can test it by identifying the word order as well as phonological and lexical similarities or the phonological morphological if I can say. So, that this, this lecture should help you to identify for yourself how to account for the or how to identify or how to find out rather the similarities and the differences among the languages that you speak. If you are a multilingual speaker, which most of the Indians are, uh, it should be, you should get an idea what is linguistic typology and how do we decide for different types and how do we 
put certain languages in certain type. So, with this I would talk about the cross linguistic similarities later um, in my discussion. Thank you.